Okay, so I think we're live. So uh, we're very grateful today to have Nicholas Baer, who's an expert on the theory and applications of rewriting graphs and other structures. And he's going to tell us about fundamentals of compositional rewriting theory. And I think we would prefer this time to have uh, questions mostly deferred to the end. So if you think of something, save it. You're welcome to write things in the chat though and other audience members can chime in if they know the answer to your question. All right, with that, let's get started. Thanks, Nick. Thanks a lot, Evan, for the nice introduction and also to you and the other organizers of the colloquium for the invitation. I must say I'm pretty excited to give a talk here because uh, the Topos and Sue Colloquium is one of my favorite uh, YouTube channels to watch. Uh, that is mainly because I recently became a father and I mean, seven o'clock at night is normally not a time <laughs> where I can watch the talks live, but I very much enjoy the series. So congrats on such a successful project. Um, and today I, I want to speak to you about um, Oops, okay, slides not moving, it's not good. Okay, <laughs> um, about compositional writing theory. And in a way, this could be applied category theory, so very much located in this community, were it not for maybe a very different style, let's say, in the in the literature. And uh, this theory started in the 1970s with the work of Hartmut Erik, where he found that you can formalize actual direct multigraphic writing in some categorical fashion, and was then developed over the next 20 years into some very nice framework where at the time, pretty much all of the writing semantics could be nicely formalized. And uh, I, I would say the moment where then really it could have become some topic in ACT was a seminal work by Pavel Subashinsky, where in, in one nice swoop, he and his uh, co-author Stephen Luck, they formalize the categories uh, that you use as data structures for these writing theories um, as adhesive categories. Basically, at the time, all the known examples almost of uh, categories where you could do writing double push out at the time were adhesive categories. And then later with some minor modifications, some sort of weakenings thereof done by Eric and his school, you know, around 25 years ago, there was an understanding that um, this field was pretty much finished, yes. So you had uh, adhesive category theory and variants, and then you had DB double push-out semantics, and that seemed to be the pinnacle of categorical writing theory. And then over the next period, um, there was some very important developments. I mean, first of all, there was a lot of different kinds of semantics and just double push-out. By the way, I will tell you a little bit about double push-out later on, of course, but this is just to give a brief overview of the literature. And there was some uh, very important point in terms of applications, really, outside of computer science for these writing systems, which was the work of Havel and Penemann, where they showed how to endow these semantics with some notion of constraints on objects and you know an application of rules, so that you, for example, could model not just direct multigraphs, but also say planar rooted binary trees and stuff like that. Um, and then, I mean, again, there was quite a lot of work on the more finer technical points, in particular this work on finitarity of categories. But around 2014, I would say uh, roughly the, this was a very, very complete theory without the compositional aspect. So the categorical writing theory, I guess, from at the stage of 2014 was very, very nice. And weirdly, that was exactly when I entered this research field. It was um, I was switching over from mathematical physics for doing a postdoc in theoretical computer science with Swan Sauna Noss at the time, who was an expert in you know biochemical writing theory. Um, and over the last yeah, now pretty much eight years, I've worked a lot on, you know, making available techniques from mathematical physics in a writing. And one of the key points, I mean, one of the early frustrations in this work was that uh, while you can formalize individual reactions, say, of biochemistry, which is, you know, rewriting with conditions, you couldn't actually formalize the Markov chain theory. So, I mean, somehow there was a huge uh, obstacle in terms of theory, what exactly is missing in order so you can formally define a Markov chain as it would be defined in general Markov chain theory. And in the course of this work, I, I think I have, especially over the last four years, four years ago, I started working with Pavel Soboszynski on a project um, and it got me really interested in this applied category theory, you know, point of view. And so I've uh, published some of the results and presented them at ACT 2019 and 21. And also in this compositionality journal, we have one of these key papers on what it is compositionality in categorical writing when you do writing with conditions. So I, I would say I have a rough idea maybe what might interest you perhaps uh, in, in the seminar series about the theory. And in particular, now we have a new 
viewpoint on compositional writing theory that permits to explain this mathematical structure in a very nice modularized fashion, and in a sense, uniform fashion. So this is joint work with Russ Hammer and Jean Crevin. Before going into the talk, I would like to express some special thanks to Richard Garner, Paul Andre Yes, and Norm Zeilberger. So to Richard, because um, he had some extremely insightful comments on the conference version of this work. Uh, in particular, you know, showing me some ways how to do some, some, you know, motivating some vibrational point of view on this stuff. I'll explain later. And to Paul and Dima, yes, and Norm Zeilberg, we have a long-standing collaboration, and they've given a lot of feedback on this work, which is very useful. And and I mean, we also work on related topics. So many thanks to these colleagues. And now I would like to give a brief overview of this talk. So in the first part. Um, so, so this this new theory is essentially a formalization of concrete writing semantics, uh, so something like double push out and sesqui push out and, and the likes, through a double categorical approach. And the idea is that you you would like to decide whether a certain semantics is compositional, so admits these continuous time Markov chains and so on, directly from the very definition of the semantics in terms of individual writing steps. An individual writing step will give rise to a square and the double category. And, and so these new structures called compositional writing double categories allow you to directly make sure that this particular semantics is compositional. And what compositional means, I will explain later. Um, and then, of course, there's a way of uh, demonstrating that, for example, double pushout and sesky pushout writing gives instances of such particular double categories. But now the burden is uh, much lighter to show that, you know, a given type of uh, semantics gives rise to compositional writing double categories. That's, I think, the main technical advantage of this new viewpoint. And then finally, of course, there is still, and, and this is more the traditional piece of the literature I showed in the beginning. Um, now, for each of the semantics, like double push and sesqui push out, you can look at individual instances, individual data types. You can look at chemistry. You can look at tree rewriting or petri nets or, I don't know, graph rewriting, of course. Um, and then you can see whether or not a given such application su supports, let's say, compositional double push or sesqui push out writing. And so this layering, sort of the size of the squares, also indicates a little bit sort of the, 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 the breadth of the literature on the things, in the sense that the compositional writing double categories um, give a very nice compression of the theory just into very few axioms on, on, on a double category. Um, and so in the first part, because of course this is still a complex framework, I would like to give a high level motivation of why you might wish to, uh, why is this interesting to be compositional for a writing system. Then of course, I'll give you um, the story of this paper and finally speak briefly about a project which I believe might be of interest to this community as well. So then compositional writing theory, um, what what is it useful for? And rather than saying directly what's compositionality, which is coming later, I'll give a motivation of what do you, what's the consequence of a writing theory to be compositional. And in a nutshell, because I was personally mainly motivated to use writing theory in the life sciences, so for chemistry, biochemistry, organic chemistry, this sort of thing, but also for social network science and other combinatorics, I suppose the main point is that without this compositionality, you cannot really translate um, standard concepts such as Markov chain theory or the notion of pathways and reaction systems or probably SQL network models and this sort of thing into sort of the formal semantics of applied category theory. And so the, the, the sort of the two technical points, if the theory is compositional, it gives rise to what I call rule algebras, but also to so-called tracelets. And, um, and so with these two ingredients, you can then fully formalize many concepts from the life sciences, which of course is then the starting point of, of new kinds of analysis. And so to maybe at least give you a quick uh, intro into what's uh, rewriting, I, I suppose double push out writing was also already mentioned in the series sometimes, um, but just a quick recap. So a rule, a writing rule in the semantics is a span uh, and the uh, input pattern, uh, an output pattern, and something you keep, at least, I mean, this is interpretation if O and I, the little morphisms are inclusions. And then you apply such uh, a rule to an object X of your category by exhibiting what's called a match. So typically some kind of monomorphism. The first part of the transformation then consists in trying to form a push out complement. So finding morphisms, uh, the left and the bottom, the square is push out, which might not be possible in the given situation, but if it is, then you can form a push out and finally obtain 
the result of the rewrite, the Rm of x. That's the result of applying this rule along this match. And I mean, personally, what I found really fascinating from the start was the observation made by this organic uh, chemistry group in Nonsa, and I mean, their collaborators, that uh, chemical re organochemical reactions are pretty much an instance of such double pushout rewriting, with a caveat that the full formalization requires this semantics of rewriting with conditions, but I mean, I'll mention that later. But roughly speaking, uh, organochemical reaction is a rearrangement of electron bonds, but uh, each individual scheme for such a transition is a relatively small pattern, like the span at the top. And then this in, can be instantiated in many different kinds of molecules, like this complex one here at the bottom right. So this really is, under certain semantics, a push-out complement and then a push-out. So the whole thing really codes, uh, it's, you know, in a way, organic chemistry is one of the nicest examples because the way chemists write these reaction almost is exactly the semantics of double push-out rewriting which is sort of a very amusing observation of this group. And yeah, I, I found this pretty amazing. Um, but one other very nice example is because now you can ask, so if these spans are not monic, what then? So here, for example, is a rule um, which clones a vertex. So the right morphism is an epi, uh, and then you know links these two vertices with an edge. That's um, a rule that plays a role in this conservative graph cohomology theory. Um, but more, more pragmatically, if you apply this rule to a directed multigraph um, and the vertex has a certain number of in and outgoing edges, then here, because uh, the, the, the morphism is an epi, so the push-out complement is no longer unique. So you have multiple inequivalent uh, options, non-isomorphic options. And each option is characterized um, by repartitioning the in and outgoing edges um, you know, in a certain way. And then, you know, in this particular rule, you glue in another edge, which has just the purpose that if you started from a connected graph, you stay connected. But that's another instance of double push out rewriting in a completely different setting, more like a combinatorial setting. And for example, if you apply this rule to uh, just uh, a graph with one vertex, you, you, and you uh, apply this rule again and again, you see this nice little combinatorial ensemble appearing where the numbers encode multiplicities to reach certain graph states. And now if you finally modify a bit the semantics to sesquip pushout, so here, instead of taking a multi pushout complement, you take a final pullback complement, but the same rule, you can, for example, generate the directed simplices by repeated application of, of, of this rule. So, I mean, it's just a quick indication that this writing semantic is quite, I mean, there's an aspect which is interesting about these systems, which is about these distributions of a possible states you can reach in repeated application of rules. But sort of the absolute by far main motivation for compositional writing theory is in studying complex um, dynamical systems, such as, for example, in biology. And so if you look at any such system, the typical characteristic is that you have an enormous number of possible, well, either macromolecules or um, you know, agents in question that can interact. And of course, you could model this with a patronet, but then each of the individual uh, entities would be a kind of token. And uh, knowing that in some of these relevant, uh, for example, in signaling pathways, then you might easily have 10 to the 22 kinds of token, let alone then, you know, distributions of occupation numbers of these token counts. Um, this is simply completely intractable, yes? And so here is really where the, you know, one of the most beautiful applications of writing theory I find is this work of Anson and Nossen colleagues. Um, because they have a very fascinating answer to this problem of complexity. And it is basically designing a custom data type for reasoning about macromolecules. And the idea is that in real life bi biochemistry, the abstraction level that's apparently useful is not of individual atoms, but of macromolecules. And these are described as abstract entities which have sites at which they can interact. Um, and so first of all, this is already quite a huge simplification because now each molecule can come in different configurations. So these sites can carry states. So this is very combinatorial. But even more importantly, actual biochemical reaction as found uh, in, in, in the lab, usually only modify a very small part of such macromolecules, for example, linked to sites. And as you see here in this picture, um, this reaction to specify it, you only need a very small sub-information about the states. And, and altogether, this leads to a very efficient encoding of biochemistry. It's actually so efficient that it's nowadays the standard encoding in databases for these kinds of reactions. Yes, also because it pretty much comes directly from the natural language style used in this literature. So I found this was pretty fascinating. So 
to then generate trajectories of such systems, you simply have to exhibit an occurrence of such a little manipulation within you know, a concrete graph state. So the graph state drawn at the bottom left has all the information, like all the states on sites and so on. And then you locally run this transformation to obtain the new state. And I mean, what's what's really uh, one of the key results of this community, it's again 20 years of work, is that nowadays there's this Kappa language and a simulator for it, and it's extremely efficient. So it's a sort of, it allows you to generate trajectories of such biochemical systems uh, in linear time with the size of the largest pattern in these reactions, which I suppose is currently the world record for producing, you know, in silico experiments, so to speak, with biochemistry. But at the end of the day, um, unfortunately, this still doesn't solve the problem. I mean, now at least you can reproduce these systems in the computer, but you still haven't really understood their function. And, and so, I mean, my point of view on this is that uh, we are not fully using, I mean, defining the rewriting semantics is only one half of the story. And the other half is then what does it mean to have this semantics? And uh, I mean, just producing sequences of states, again, is only one half. The other half is that if you look here at this little illustration of a rewriting sequence, so you have an input graph, you act with a creation of an edge, creation, deletion, creation, creation, very simple example. There's clearly also this level of uh, looking at the way these individual steps have interacted. Yes. So drawn as this sort of upstairs part of the diagram in this little comic strip. And now what this offers is a possibility that you wouldn't have from Petronet theory and you don't, don't have if you just look at sequences of graphs. Namely, rather than looking at each isomorphism class of graph as its own kind of token in a Petronet, which is the only alternative if you use just sequences of graph, you can now look at the fine structure of these graphs and, for example, ask how many triangles are in there. And triangle here is sort of a placeholder for interesting sort of dynamically relevant pattern in these reaction systems. And the point is you, you can compute the, the evolution of the numbers of these patterns directly from interaction with these uh, rewriting patterns, yes? So there is, uh, for example, this observation, which is pretty evident here, that here in this particular example, the first and third step, they don't really contribute to this particular count. So in, in listing all the options, you can produce a triangle, you can omit this effectively, as long as you can count how many ways there are to insert these sort of null rounds, yes? Um, there's a full-fledged theory about what are exactly the semantics for what I call tracelets for these sort of interaction patterns, um, which is a little bit intricate. It's sort of uh, inductively defined concept, but I mean, this is not really the topic of today's talk, but I, today I would rather give as a motivation for compositionality, the rule algebra formalism. And this is essentially um, looking at the two-step interactions of rules. So. The idea here is um, in order to do all of these um, mathematical physics techniques, you need a way of reasoning about the combinatorics of interactions of rules. And the idea is you, you take a rule and you map it um, to the basis vector of a vector space curly R. So vector space index actually by equivalence classes of rules, but let's glance over that. Um, and then you define a binary product, uh, so-called rule algebra product on the space. And here, um, the right-hand side ranges um, over ways of composing rules. And by composing, I mean partially overlapping and then performing a computation that sort of puts a box around and you know reads out the net effect of this little pattern of interaction. And uh, this depends on the semantics and has to be defined. So compositionality later on, one half is precisely giving such uh, a composition operation. And uh, this second half of compositionality is to give conditions under which this operation is associative, strictly associative, um, because then it gives rise. So this rule algebra, so the vector space together with the binary product becomes an associative unit of algebra, and that is the with the unit element is you know basis vector associated to the trivial rule, and and this is a necessary first step for getting something like continuous time Markov chain theory, for example. And now um, I, I will just briefly sketch this and then get into the main part of the talk. So for Pechinets, which many people know here, I guess, takes the simplest kind with just one kind of token and just one transition taking one part to producing two. So this is an autocatalytic reaction system. And in continuous time Markov chain theory, you would like to reason about the probability at time t, if you fire these at random with a certain semantics, to obtain n particles. And so the standard approach to do this is due to Delbrick. So you form what's called the probability generating function, coefficient of x to the n is probably a time n to, to be, uh, sorry, a time t to be uh, have n particles. And the nice thing is that uh, 
Delbrick um, put together all of the, you know, you can also give a different derivation of the evolution equation, but Delbrick's form is nice because it gives this nice differential operator characterization of what's called the mass equation. And here x hat is just a multiplication with the formal variable x, d by dx is the normal derivative. Of course, then if you look at this, I mean, one can derive this heuristically, but one can also directly give an explanation from the viewpoint of this rule algebra theory, which is what I would do now. So the idea is that you need a second vector space, which is over configurations, and the configuration is an ISO class of objects in your category C. So let's take, for example, again, the example of Petrinet. So uh, the basis uh, configurations are discrete graphs, and the only characteristic of an ISO class of discrete graphs is the number of vertices. And now um, the, the key definition is that you want to give a linear operator associated to a rule, which acts on a state X as a sum over all outcomes for playing this rule in all possible ways, yes? So this uh, right-hand side is a finite distribution because we assume everybody rules and objects are finite for these applications. Um, and so the right-hand side, because you map to ISO classes also can produce combinatorial factors, yes? Because some ways to apply the rule might lead to an isomorphic outcome. And now um, this associativity is crucial because uh, if your this rule composition operation is associative, you can actually show that a row is the bona fide representation of this rule algebra. And this gives unlocks this computational device, which is reasoning about two-step sequences by first reasoning about compositions of rules through this rule algebra product. And this is really the key operation here. And just to give a first glimpse at what, what it can do, so going back to the Petronet example. So here states were indexed by, by natural numbers. And then the representation of the rule that creates vertices acts on a state n as n plus one, because you can get one more vertex in exactly one way. And if you delete a vertex, then this can be done in zero ways if there is no vertex or n ways if there are n vertices and you get n minus one vertices in each of the cases. So you get overall n times the state n minus one. And now if you use this Delbrick operator and you simply use the algebra above, you can show that um, the evolution equation is given by alpha, the basic rate times the representation of the actual transition that defines the system. So take one vertex out, put two vertices in, minus a diagonal term, which is a correction term, from uh, which can be explained from Markov chain theory. And now not only have we translated uh, the evolution equation into this rewriting theoretic mechanism, but actually this directly generalizes to a very... Uh, many different kinds of writing semantics, including the biochemistry ones. So the idea is for these situations where you have a set of rules that define your system and some input state or distributions, um, you can get continuous Markov chain semantics. You know, you, when the rules have additional base rate parameters, you can get discrete time Markov chains, for example, used in social network modeling, and you can get combinatorics. Um, and so for, for the continuous time Markov chains, we can now, you know, after all these eight years, we can basically give uh, the, for the first time a full formalization, namely that uh, kappa and mole, so these bio and organochemistry are Sesky push out writing and double push out writing for rules with conditions. Yeah, so that's, um, and, and so this piece about rules with conditions was uh, exactly the main content of this compositionality paper I wrote with Jean Crevin. Okay, and so finally, so what is it now um, that you can do with this point of view with rule algebra? And so I, I think our poster example now for this is this, this case study where you apply a rule that generates trees uniformly at random. So this is a Remy generator um, and where you count sub patterns. So, so trees, sub trees uh, in this ensemble of all possible planar rooted binary trees. And what's fascinating about this is, so the ensemble itself, after 100 steps of uniform generation, you already have 10 to the 217 possible isomorphism classes of planar rooted binary trees. But uh, computing this pattern count evolution with these, you know, particular rule algebra calculus, you can do it, um, for example, on the right is shown the joint probability distribution of the entire distribution of planar rooted binary trees up to n equal 100 um, for these patterns on the top right, these two. Um, and this can be done as a linear recurrence then in the end of the day. I mean, the calculation is complex and maybe if you want to really look at this, I have some slides about this, but uh, so the high level motivation is that really by formalizing compositionality in rewriting, we get, get a new composition computational device, which allows us to reason about these systems and hopefully get some insights also in this biochemistry at some point. 
Okay, so <laughs> half talk for motivation, but uh, I, I think it's warranted because the theory I'm going to show you now is still relatively complex, but I think uh, it might be of mathematical interest independently. Our motivation was, of course, what I showed in the beginning of the talk, this uh, compositionality, which is necessary for doing you know, analysis in the life sciences and so on. So the top level of this hierarchy, and this is a new piece, is um, a formalization of the conditions when a rewriting semantics is compositional in terms of double cut crease. And so this uses some ingredients. And the first of, of these ingredients is um, vibrational structures. So of course, I suppose in this community, everybody knows Grotendieck vibrations. So functors Grotendieck vibration, if you can, for every morphism in the base, you can exhibit such a Cartesian lift. And being Cartesian lift is uh, precisely this condition at the bottom. There's a dual version, an opt version, I guess, um, where you have op Cartesian liftings. Um, so far, so good. But but so for the rewriting, interestingly, we need a weakening of this concept of Grotendieck op vibration. And the weakening is that rather than uh, exhibiting, uh, um, you know, up to an essentially unique lift, Carte uh, op Cartesian lift, we permit the situation where uh, you have a possibly empty family of such liftings. And then the sort of the second part of the condition looks slightly different than in the op Cartesian case in that you basically you do not fill the left interior square here already at the outset, but you only ask that there exist a member of one of the families that, that fits the diagram on the right. And so unfortunately then the last line is necessary to, to make this in a suitable way, essentially unique. And I was told by Richard Garner that maybe there's a way of quotienting this out so it gets a little nicer, but uh, yeah, I haven't gotten around to working this out in detail. Okay. Um, so this preserves some of the nice properties of uh, Grotnik op vibration. For example, it lifts isomorphisms in a suitable way. And, and then there is a property, I mean, would be interesting if somebody knew, um, we needed this weird uh, pullback lifting property um, at some point in, in the proofs. Um, but I, I would not be to totally surprised if this was also standard for Grotnik of vibrations, but okay. Anyways, and so the final type of uh, vibrational structure we need is a yet further weakening. So now, rather than just asking for a family of these liftings, which might be empty, we now ask modulo. So you take a morphism in the base F, and now this family includes data, which is uh, sort of extensions of the codomain of F by morphisms um, you know, indexed by this family. So F star J are so-called residues. Um, again, such that in any diagram as on the bottom left, you, you can um, bring it into the shape on the right where, where you have a residue that then fills the whole thing into these two commutative regions. And again, with a sort of, unfortunately, very inelegant way of saying that this is essentially unique. And here, um, Richard told me that um, this is closely related to the theory of Tolen, or these semi-final lift things, where again, this would be the quotiented version, apparently. So I hope at some point, maybe this can be polished to be a little bit more, more elegant, but okay. So these are the vibrational ingredients. Um, these, uh, there's some nice property of these residues that sort of, they are unsplittable. So this is, I guess, a semi-final property. If you took as a particular shape for, for this diagram, uh, morphism F followed by one of its residues, then there's, and, and you found another residue to split this, so to speak, then actually the two residues would have to be isomorphic. So in, in this sense, these uh, residues have a certain finality property, yes? Okay, but, okay. And so then we need uh, one other concept from Deere's work uh, called multisums um, or multi coproducts, I guess. Um, so multisum for two objects A and B is a family of co-spans that classifies all the co-spans from A and B and in an essentially unique way. So whenever you have two multisum elements that classify the same co-span, they have to be, there must be exist this isomorphism. So it's basically a generalization of co-product, I guess. Um, and and then these uh, have some nice extension properties, but okay, maybe I skip over that. And now um, finally, to get to compositional writing double categories, just quickly a slide. I, I don't think in this community to, I have to introduce double categories, but I just wanted to give some notation conventions. Um, of course, we use some which are close to the way we denote stuff in the writing theory. So in particular, 
our morphisms go from right to left, sorry. Uh, and these and these harpoon arrows are the weakly associative direction, which I heard sometimes are then the vertical morphisms and so on. I mean, for us, the horizontal morphisms are the ones that weakly compose and the vertical morphisms um, strictly compose. But uh, in particular, they are also usually of a particular stable system of monics, so they get a special symbol. But okay, so these are our conventions. And um, then a particular role is played by source and target functors, which read out the vertical source and target of such squares. Uh, and they are functors with respect to this direction where you have a strict composition, yes? So, I mean, bona fide functors. And then, of course, there is a horizontal composition. Um, and I realized that I should say that in these diagrams, just simply to save some white space, because, I mean, they get quite large at some point. Um, so sometimes I mean that if I write a, a square that is a composition of two, then this is meant as a strictly commutative diagram. So, okay. Um, I sometimes don't explicitly write that a composite of two squares is you know, obtained by vertical horizontal composition, but it's implied, yes. It's just in the ensuing diagrams are sometimes quite large, so, okay. And now here, finally, <laughs> half of the talk around, and here's the final, here's the key concept of this whole work, um, that of compositional writing double cut trees. And I'm going through this slowly. So um, a double category is a compositional rewriting double category. If the the category of um, you know the, the the in our convention the horizontal uh, sorry the, the vertical morphisms and objects in there um, has multi sums, if uh, the the zero and the one have pullbacks, and then I mean this is another one of these occasions where I hope it can be polished a little bit, but okay. So it's this weird decomposition property under horizontal composition. So if you have a square, like the curvy one in the back, and its top boundary decomposes into a sequence of horizontal morphisms, then there should exist in an essentially unique way a splitting of the square into two squares whose horizontal composite is giving back the back square um, in, in an essentially unique way. So that's a horizontal decomposition property. And finally, and, and this is really the interesting piece in terms of vibrations, um, the source functor should be a multi-op vibration and the target functor should be a residual multi-op vibration. And now, why on earth would that be a characterization of compositionality? And so at this point, really, um, this was sort of, I mean, I should say, of course, we went from the other direction. We had the rewriting semantics and then we went here. But I mean, it makes sense even also directly from these definitions. So what, what it gives you is that um, such a CRDC allows a concurrency theorem. And a the concurrency theorem says something about, so remember that individual squares are individual rewrites. So the configuration at the left is a two-step rewriting sequence. And uh, the only datum necessary is that the, so that's the outcome, so the bottom left corner of the first square is the input, the bottom right corner of the second square. And what this structure of CRDC guarantees is that you can, uh, in an essentially unique way, transform this into a diagram as on the right. So on the top, you, you have a configuration where you have a multi-sum element, a particular one, which is generated by this process called synthesis. Um, and then this morphism marked star is a residue for you know this, this right part of the co span. So the configuration at the top, the first, uh, so the top half of the diagram on the right is a composition of rules. And the curvy bottom square is a one-step rewrite. And so this is precisely what I had previously in these little pictures. So a partial overlap of rules in, in quotation marks, one of these possible contributions to this rule algebra product. So this is a really absolutely key operation for compositional writing reasoning, yes? And then also what's important, you can also get the converse. Um, you can get from a composite rule and a one-step application of this composite rule to the two-step sequence. And this in turn is important for guaranteeing that uh, compositions of rules capture the composition of their, you know, of the re representations associated to um, individual rewrite rules. Okay. And so the proof really, and here I should say, normally, I mean, we started out in this conference paper for defining such concurrency theorems for these rewriting semantics for double push and sesky, where you have nonlinear rules, something like in this conservative graph differential. It was a heinously complicated proof. And at the end of the day, we arrived at some concurrency theorem, but we were not very satisfied because it wasn't very, you know, it's quite a 
complicated structure. And then, you know, thanks also to remarks by Richard and my colleagues, we arrived at the possibility to, to completely encapsulate all of these structures in this very simple proof of concurrency theorem for all kinds of writing semantics we knew. And so this proof works as follows. So for the synthesis thing, if you start from a two-step sequence, you use a multi-sum, then you use that the target functor is a residual multi-op vibration. So you exhibit a residue, a particular one, which is universe, essentially unique, um, and you know can then produce these two vertically stacked squares on the right. And then you use that uh, the source functor is a multi-op vibration to get the two vertically stacked blue squares on the left. And finally, you just horizontally compose the bottom two guys and get this curvy face. And altogether, this is exactly the premise of the synthesis part of the concurrency theorem. We have produced the top thing as a composite rule and the bottom thing is a one-step sequence. And conversely, uh, this is equally nice. And here is where you need this weird horizontal decomposition property. So first you exhibit these two squares in the back, which whose horizontal composition gives the front square. Then you vertically compose. And finally, this gives you the shape of a two-step sequence. And this is really it. So modulo having to define residual multi-op vibrations and multi-op vibrations and so on, and this weird horizontal decomposition property, this directly gives you a way of showing this very essential concurrency theorem. So this is one advantage of this viewpoint, but sort of the really purely technically, we not only need a concurrency theorem, but in order for being able to represent rule algebras with matrices with linear operators, we need an associativity theorem as well. And here, um, this reasons about composing two rules and then the composite with a third. And you have to demonstrate that this is in one-to-one -one correspondence modulo essential uniqueness um, of, config of a particular configuration where you compose the third with the second rule and then the composite with the first. This is simply because of the way these little diagrams work. Um, this reasoning has to be, in this sense, compositional, I guess. Um, and I mean, here really you see the full advantage of this new high level process, which is, um, and I, I, I'm just gonna flash this briefly simply because um, it is just so amazing that you can do this in you know, this one universal semantics. So first you apply this concurrency theorem once, then you compose vertically the middle guys and you see, aha, we have a prerequisite for the uh, analysis part of the concurrency theorem, which gets you this red shape. So and then you use the multi-sum, you apply concurrency theorem again, and so on and so forth. And then finally, funnily enough, in this last step of the associativity, or second to last step, you need this um, pullback lifting of multi-op vibrations to exhibit the yellow structure. And finally, then you see uh, you are splitting a residue. So all the guys in the vertical back column have to be isos. And then in the front, you can also show these are all isos. So finally, you have exhibited one half of the associativity theorem. Well, okay, maybe maybe that is, it's just to sketch that, I mean, for us, uh, it, it made it possible to also get associativity theorem for this very complicated generic SSV push out writing, you know, for arbitrary spans and so on, fusing and cloning and, and yeah. So so for, for us at the moment, this is sort of the level of, of uh, technology. And so I, I, I want to conclude this um, overview with um, showing how concretely you get you know, from these known double push and sesc push, why do they give rise to compositional writing double categories? Because the, the main technological advantage is that yeah, you, to, to show a particular semantics is compositional, you only have to go from the second to the first level, yes? And so this is what the, this next part of the talk is about. So um, I usually need a notion of stable system of monics because these will model our matchings. And then I guess uh, push-outs, pullbacks are well known. Maybe final pullback complements are not so well known. It's a type of commutative square which has is a final pullback complement if it is a pullback, and if for any square, uh, any diagram as on the bottom right where top triangle is uh, commutative and the outer square is a pullback, there exists uniquely this uh, um, morphism, and the right square is also pullback. So that's called final pullback complement. Um, and so first quick observation is that for any square of which the horizontal or the vertical arrows are identities, these are simultaneously all three kinds. Um, and so this motivates to define um, six different kinds of categories, basically for each type of such squares where, and I mean, the interest here is that the vertical morphisms are from the stable system of one XM, horizontal arbitrary. You can either define category as horizontal composition of such square or vertical composition. 
and this gives you for each of the three kinds, so in total six categories. And uh, so then, because these are strict, uh, have strict compositions, you can define four kinds of boundary functors, and I call them domain and codomain for the vertical, uh, domain and codomain, and source and target for the horizontal, just to have a quick name. And so really what started this idea of, you know, searching for vibrational structures was an observation made by Richard Garner on the structure of this DOM functor for the kind T of being pullback squares. Um, and so under some assumptions, it's quite a, it's a really nice example which it came up with. Um, so the pullback squares with a uh, horizontal composition. So this domain functor is a Grothendieck equilibration where the Cartesian liftings are given by FPC squares. Uh, it's also simultaneously a Grothendieck op vibration where the op Cartesian liftings are given by pushouts, but so it's a bi vibration. But moreover, you have uh, a very complex technical condition called the spec Chevalier condition satisfied. Um, and, and, and so I, I can only speculate, but I think Richard suggested this because in our conference paper, we had one technical calculation, which was about commutative cubes of this shape, where we know that the top guy is a pullback, right faces are FPCs, the front face is a pushout, and you want to show that the bottom face is a pullback and the back face is a pushout. Um, you, you can do that by hand, by taking a pullback and using universal properties. But Richard discovered that this is precisely what the back Chevalier condition says, if, you know, for this particular functor and this particular category. So, I, I mean, I personally thought it was really elegant and uh, it, it, it really motivated me to look, I mean, to learn a bit about these vibrational structures. And then, of course, to play with it and to see uh, and sorry, and to conclude this part, uh, if you restrict it, rather than having arbitrary pullbacks to pushouts or FCCs, you break this. You only retain one of the vibrational structures. Yes, that was a sort of occasional observation. Anyways, but so the interesting point is that for expressing what we need for concurrency theorem, we have to look at the source and target functors, actually, it turns out. Um, and here, this pullback category now under vertical composition doesn't have any interesting vibrational structures, it seems. But it turns out if you restrict the pullback squares to being FPCs, you get a Grothendieck off vibration. So that is pretty straightforward. But if you restrict to pushouts, you get exactly one of the canonical instances of a multi op vibration. And so um, the idea is that this notion of multi initial pushout complements is precisely already, I mean, suggestively already in this form I showed for multi-off vibrations, in the sense that if you have two arrows, uh, F followed by uh, one of those stable monics, um, then you can define a family of pushout squares that fit into this sort of sequence. And, and this is a multi-initial pushout complement if it satisfies this universal property that essentially for any larger pushout square of which this original F and its uh, partner is a subdiagram, then you can uniquely fill this with two pushout squares. And one of them is then the top one is a member of this family, essentially uniquely. Um, and so you can, so, so this, this part of the definition, of course, it looks like a reflected version of this multi-op vibration definition. Um, and, um, well, you can characterize when it's possible to 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 have multi-initial pushout complements. Has essentially to do with a way of splitting. I mean, essentially, this says uh, condition when it's possible to split the pushout via taking certain pullbacks. But okay, anyways. But uh, so again, like this definition is precisely an instance of this multi-op vibration, the version we have in the paper. And then what Richard said that you could maybe quotient amounts to well, then you would have to quotient also these these uh, push out complements and yeah so that's some ongoing work but anyway so it formalizes an important piece of the definitions and uh, the other interesting point is that uh, if you now look at um oh, sorry yes and then of course uh, this target functor is a multi-op vibration that was the end part of it sorry and finally um the source functor has even more interesting structure namely okay so if it's on, on push-out squares, you just get a Grothendieck op vibration. But if it's on uh, FVC squares, you get a residual multi-op vibration. And, and that is exactly the most generic version of vibrational structure we have. So for the push-out story, I, I suppose this is a traditional example for Grothendieck op vibration. But uh, for, for the FVC case, we have to require the existence of a factorization structure. So M will be a stable system of monics and E another class so that you particular can factor any morphism as element of m after element of e 
And now this was the definition of residual multi-op vibration, and you can precisely produce such a multi-op vibration with a calculus on FPC squares. And so here, um, the statement is that if you have an FPC square where the vertical left part um, is factored, you can take a push out, but I mean, then this morphism which is mediating, I mean, which exists by universal probability of push out might not be of the required type in M. So you take an EM factorization, take a pullback, and then there's a lemma which tells that if the bottom guy is a pullback and the outer thing is an FPC and the vertical outer morphism is on M and so on, then uh, the top two, com sorry, top two commutative squares composed as an FPC and the bottom is an FPC. And so again, there's a proof of then essential uniqueness and this gives our canonical example of a residual multi-op vibration. And so finally, why is this then, you know, relevant for compositional categorical writing semantics? Well, we define rules as mentioned earlier as spans in DPO and Sesky semantics. Uh, we, we qualify them whether or not the morphisms are in this class M as linear or generic. And then uh, double pushout semantics is one where a square is defined as a special diagram in the double category of spans where both squares are pushouts. And Sesky pushout semantics is where the left square is a pushout and the right square is a final pullback complement. And now you can see why these vibrational properties I mentioned earlier are important because now we look at the requisites for compositional writing double cut Cree. So the first step is that um, basically, you know, these situations, the units are pretty straightforward because as mentioned earlier, these squares of type by the horizontal or vertical morphism, all units are simultaneously pullbacks, FECs and pushouts. So this is a given, but uh, the horizontal composition already requires quite some strong structure on the underlying category. Namely for double pushout semantics, it's, you know, certain stability of pushouts and also for Sesky of FPCs then. Um, and the decomposition property um, is exactly giving the other half of Van Kampen for the expert in double pushout writing. So the other half of the artisivity property of the category. While for, for the uh, Sesky semantics, interestingly, um, this is covered by the Beck-Chevalier condition that Richard discovered. Um, so, in any event, you can give them the requisites for the category to support these decomposition properties. The, the you know, D1 having pullbacks is a bit technical. I'm, I'm going to skip over that. But finally, we get to a table which simply tells you for which kind of semantics do you need to put which conditions on the category. And this is purely decided on this little calculational paradigm I showed, you know, showing these different properties. And so half of the structure is pretty much uh, exhibiting this double category structure. Um, for which you need in particular either artisivity properties or suitable stability properties. And then the other half um, is these vibrational properties, but these are essentially inherited by these I showed you for individual types of squares. Basically, if you stick together squares to get double push or Sesky steps, the uh, vibrational properties get inherited suitably. So finally, we have a very quick way or relatively quick way of deciding whether rewriting semantics is compositional. And now, I'm, I'm not going to say much, because of lack of time, of course, about this lowest level of, uh, of the hierarchy about individual writing semantics, only to say that in the paper, we have a large catalog of cut queries that are either known to be adhesive or quasi topo. I, the rough idea is for double push out, you need category adhesivity properties. For Sesky push out, you tend to need quasi topo. I, but, and then, I mean, the details are in the paper um, and sort of, I mean, for, for me, one part of applied category theory is here that you have a little catalog of constructions, how to construct uh, useful categories, such as, for example, undirected multigraphs from simpler categories with known adhesivity properties or quasi topo structures. And so having a better curated such catalog would definitely be on the wish list for a future evolution of this type of, of uh, fundus of knowledge. Okay, and finally, uh, just, to, to uh, conclude the talk, I want to briefly speak about the CoReact project, which um, is essentially an attempt, or it's hopefully going to be an attempt for, I mean, how would we now reflect this knowledge in something like the NLAB or you know, another kind of curated corpus of knowledge? Um, and this project, I mean, it's named as, uh, you know, cock based rewriting because we, we want to formalize, we want to translate these uh, categorical structures into, formalization in COC, um, and we have assembled a team of experts. Hopefully, we will get the funding. <laughs> it's 
calls still out. And for the moment, we, we have a sort of experimental working group on this and ultimately should have a web page for the project. So uh, yeah, I'm just mentioning this here because if you see this talk in the future, we might already have some examples. And uh, I, I think what might be interesting to this community, and that's why I'm mentioning this, um, so we want to build in particular a category theory library in Cork. And of course, there are already many such libraries, but the one we want to build um, will also have double categories in it and universal constructions and so on. So, uh, and I mean, I'm not an expert on Cork, but my expert collaborators tell me that we will have, of course, a very well, I don't know, the, the, the technical implementation will be very efficient. I don't know what, but I mean, for sure, it'll be very principled and we will do experiments also on how to formalize diagrammatic reasoning in Cork. Um, and so the, the particular piece I think could use a lot of input from this community is about this, you know, how do you actually get to these categories with suitable adhesivity or quasi topos properties? We already have a small catalog of constructions, but surely this is not complete. And we have a lot of open questions, uh, which presumably can be answered from the literature, but uh, we would need some pointers. So, um, I mean, as mentioned earlier, Richard observed that, for example, these residual multi-op vibrations presumably are very closely related or are exactly up to quotient the semi-final liftings of Tolan. So then this was used in algebraic topology. And of course, the question is, what else can we learn from that? Um, in terms of concrete semantics, there is this question, there's other semantics besides DPO and Sesky push out. And in particular, this rewriting with conditions is something we would still need to understand how to fully formalize in double categories. This is not yet done. And finally, I think the largest piece of where we, I mean, already this work, um, this paper is 86 pages, about 70 references. It was a lot of work to even find the bits and pieces like from Adamac, some stuff very fundamental like factorization systems, some other things very specialized, like when does a quasi topos admit such factorization system and so on. I mean, I'm pretty sure that here we could profit greatly from speaking to expert in ACT and uh, well, evidently that would be a wish. For, for this project. And, but with that, uh, I, I'll leave you and, and I would just like to say merci beaucoup, thank you. And uh, thank you also again to the Tobos Institute organizers uh, for this opportunity to speak here. And I would be happy to answer questions. Thanks, Nick, that was great. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to turn it over to questions. And um, so anyone who wants to can, can raise their hand or if, or just uh, start start talking even so. I see David. You have a question. Dana has one. Coming in. It looks like Dana. Yes, I hate to mention this, but <clears throat> there might be connection with the recent work of Stephen Wolfram and his collaborators, which heavily use graph rewriting. I don't think Wolfram has any idea of category theory, but it might be a place for an application. Uh, I don't know whether it's a good idea, but I recommend that somebody of your team look at it before Wolfram looks at it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you, you would actually be surprised. Stephen Wolfram gave a talk in the seminar on graph writing theory I'm organizing and also his collaborator, Jonathan Lura, and we are actually <laughs> very much in, in interaction with these people exactly to discuss the uh, formalizations and category theory. No, no, I mean, it's it's exactly the piece. It's not so much as who is first, but it's more about that we feel that if really you explain physics through these multi-way systems would be nice to have a formalization. I mean, so so this framework is general. Uh, we, we sort of, I mean, in Wolfram's work, it's very hard to pinpoint what exactly is the semantics, what exactly is the data type. But indeed, we are <laughs> we are in very active interaction with this group. Uh, uh, some of whom also, you know, we had workshops on this and so on. So yes, no, no, it's it's very relevant. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, keep in mind that Wolfram is trying to explain ideas of computability, and so that's uh, that's an aspect that's uh, very important for for what he's doing. So. Uh, yes, so, so, so in fact, uh, these trace sets I avoided in, in the talk, but sort of briefly sketched are precisely, presumably formalization of these multi-ways. And I mean, again, there's quotients he's doing that is that are not fully easy to explain, but uh, no, no, we, 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 we I mean, I, I'm originally a mathematical physicist and I would be very happy if it could be fully formalized to get general relativity from these multi-way writing systems. But I mean, currently our understanding is that, I mean, 
it'll take some work to formalize this because Wolfram works in a more, I mean, it's not so much about computability, but actually computing things on a supercomputer is mathematical. And this is not so compatible <laughs> so far with our um, very theoretical approach. So also, but, you started from cellular automata, right? And so that's a different kind of motivation, that kind of like evolution of patterns and cellular automata was uh, his original motivation, I think. Well, 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 so in this multi-way computations, he's working with uh, exactly graph writing rules to get away from just cellular automata. So that was his main motivation. And then he's looking at exactly these histories of applying in sequence uh, rewriting rules and tries to reason about the properties of this sort of object that is essentially this, you know, starting from a state and then applying in all possible ways the rules. Um, so this is exactly sort of this uh, combinatorial perspective. It's just not very clear. Um, I mean, there's some question about what exactly it is you are computing then. And I mean, from my experience, it's quite difficult to say which data type you use for that because it has strong implications on the type of things you can compute. And I mean, it's it's not so easy to discuss with this group because they are more on the actual front of computation and it's very interesting what they're doing, I think. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, my feeling is it would be very valuable to formalize this properly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Valeria? Hello, hi Nicholas. Uh, very Hello. interesting talk. Hello. Um, I, sorry, you can you can see me now. Uh, ah. I have a clarification question only, something that I missed because my mind wandered. Um, uh, can you go back to the slide where you're talking about the Beck Chevalet conditions? Yes. How did uh, you kind of find... come into the story? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, let me find it. Uh, just one sec. Um, how does it work? How can I go back? Yeah, here it is, I think. Good, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So I should say there was a conference paper version of this work, and it was about sort of, <laughs> with the same authors, uh, head through the world type of attempt of getting a concurrency theorem for this sort of sesqui version of the writing. You know, we have final mm -hmm. public complement and push out. And in this paper, there was a point where we had something which, I mean, normally you are used to adhesivity properties in these von Kampen cube things, but this here looked very ad hoc. And it felt like it should have some sort of meaning because it felt mm -hmm. like a very universal property of these, you know, somehow you have a cube uh, and then internally you take a pullback and then, you know, that this uh, mediating morphism the, to the pullback is an ISO is somehow coming from the FPC property. And then I asked Richard, uh, because I mean, I had asked Richard some other questions about quasi topos theory, which mm -hmm. he had worked on in context of rewriting. And then he said uh, this, I mean, he said precisely that this looks like a Beck Chevalet condition. <laughs> and then already suggested pretty much that it should be a bona fide Beck Chevalet condition if you look at, uh, you know, precisely this category where, you know, you just take pullbacks and this under horizontal composition and look at the domain functor. And so, I mean, I didn't come up with this, this was Richard. Uh, I thought it was pretty. I, it is I mean, interesting. And, it is very yeah. interesting to me because of this fact that, you know, people tend to say, okay, we need to ask for Beck Chevalet conditions whenever we're trying to do logical things. And, you know, yeah. it, it, it is nice to see it appearing somewhere else because, you know, it, uh, the Beck Chevalet condition always looks a little bit ad hoc. If, uh, yeah, know. exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and I mean, uh, what was very funny is that a similar type of statement where you replace the FECs with push outs then you are talking about some completely different kind of mathematical structure called this, you know, one half of the Van Kampen condition. And mm -hmm. so it is interesting that it is not some sort of general theory that suddenly something like Beck Chevalier generalizes to all kinds of settings. It's really specific to this sesqui setting. So, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, and from here going to the story I showed with the multi operation residual multi operation was an additional work because somehow simply it's also that sort of these source and target functors don't have such nice probably as just Grotendieck vibration or off vibrations, and particularly not simultaneously. So, mm -hmm. no, no, but I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful to Richard. That was one of the most important pointers getting to this particular type of theory, yes. Well, thank you. That, 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 that explained. <laughs> thank <laughs> yes, thanks. Uh, Martin, did you have a question? Hi, yeah, thanks. Hello. Yeah, thank you, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I was wondering, there is this, uh, when you think uh, vibration, you also think uh, 
on the index side and the growth and the construction, the fibers construction, all of that. Have you have you thought of that in this context? What it may be telling you? Interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I must admit that. I mean, I, I think it's because I'm not looking at these vibrations. Yeah. Out of, I mean, my, my context is that these vibrations permit me to split certain squares, and I'm, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I wonder, I honestly wonder if it might be useful of reasoning about maybe um, all ways you can form a rewrite step. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it you see, like uh, now having exhibited these properties, I very much hope that then. You know, reflecting on what else you can do with vibrations, you, you can get to new types of computations in our theory. But I, I mean, I only grasp at this by, you know, we, we only grasp at this in this work by, you know, showing that there are these properties, but we haven't really had any time to think about it. I mean, golden deconstruction maybe would be, uh, I would be very interested to see what one can do with that, but I have at the moment no idea about it. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So we're past the hour mark, so maybe we should stop the recording and stuff now. Uh, but if uh, the speaker has time, looks like there are some more questions. So if the speaker has time, we could we could hang out on Zoom some more to, to discuss. Um, so I'm going to try to stop the recording. Yeah, so let's thank the speaker.